Okay, so today we're here with Rhett Talbot once again, Jeff Sarween, and Dana Riddle from Hawaii. Uh, we already, Rhett, you've been on here a couple of times before, so Jeff, you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Jeff Sarwin. Um, I've been in the aquatics industry or aquarium industry for about 17 years now. I've worked in it for most of that. Um, been keeping reef tanks and fish only tanks and fish, you know, freshwater fish tanks for about 20 years. I'm also the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society here in San Diego. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us today. And from the source itself, we have uh, Dana Riddle. If you could just give us a little background. I've been a hobbyist since 1964. This was back when we kept marine tanks in a metaframe stainless steel tank and had to coat the slate bottom with uh, some sort of mastic. Uh, I'm older than dirt. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm still learning a lot about uh, corals. I, I wish I knew more than I do. But glad to be here. Glad to have you. It's been uh, quite the adventure getting all of us together. I guess that's one of the uh, obstacles. Um, oh, we lost Rhett again. I'm here. Go ahead and carry on. Okay, we'll be discussing the recent going-ons in Hawaii uh, in relation to the aquarium world. Um, and while we have Hawaii on the table, I'd like to actually throw the ESA, uh, Endangered Species Act, into the mix so we can distinguish it um, from what's going on in Hawaii, uh, but we'll get to that later. So, Rhett, we'll start with you. Why don't we start by breaking down the eight aquarium fishery-related bills that were proposed in Hawaii? Sure. So, um, so we've got eight bills this this legislative session, and this is a um, odd numbered year. So this means that any bill that is deferred or dies in a committee this year will actually um, will actually carry over to next year and be automatically introduced. So Hawaii works on a two year on a two year legislative session. So it's important to understand that um, the bills are looking at this year. We've got. Essentially, um, five are in the House, and all five were heard last week. Um, the, they are HB 511, which is a bill that would give marine fishers the same protection that freshwater fishers have against harassment. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail if you want, but this um, really goes back to what happened last May in Hawaii between um, uh Sea Shepherd and Renee Umberger and divers uh, interacting with a couple of aquarium fishermen. Um, then we have uh, HB 606, uh, which, which is also in the House, and that was uh, proposed to be a, a moratorium, a 10-year moratorium on the fishery, and it would have uh, put in place, it would have given, uh, put some money aside to allow fishers uh, training to move away from fishing and find another career. So it's the 10 year moratorium with money preserved to help fishers find a new career. Um, HB 883 was a bill that specifically looked at or wanted to define what cruel treatment or substantial injury was um, in, in the aquarium fishery. And, uh, and, and it wanted to make those fishes that were collected or harvested um, with cruel treatment or substantial injury insofar as uh, HB 83 defined it, make them illegal to sell. Um, HB 873 was a straight up ban bill and the fishery. And then HB uh, 483 was a bill or is a bill that would allow um, uh, enforcement officers the ability to be able to inspect aquarium fisher catch without probable cause. And there's some controversy around that one. So those are our five bills in the House. All were heard last week. And then we've got three bills in the Senate. We've got uh, SB 322, which would criminalize the aquarium fishery. We've got SB 670. That would put a whole bunch of regulations in place in terms of the transport of fishes. And then we've got SB 1340, which is the companion bill to HB 883, which would define cruel treatment and uh, substantial injury to fishes. So those are eight bills we're looking at this year. Okay, uh, and like you said, uh, five were heard. 
So on Friday, February 13th, the uh, five House bills were voted on. Um, three bills passed, two of those were with amendments and two were deferred. Um, what kind of impact would the ones that passed have on the aquarium trade? Stick with I'd be happy to answer that question, Caitlin. Um, well, hello, you're back. Oh, yeah. The, um, the, the ones that passed uh, are HB 483, and that's a bill that has to do with inspection, um, which would give, uh, theoretically, give enforcement officers the ability to inspect a, a commercial fisher's catch um, without probable cause. Um, and that passed as is, no changes. Um, HB 511 passed, and that was the one that would um, give marine fishers, not just aquarium fishers, but anybody fishing in the marine environment, will give them the same protections that fishers in Florida, in fresh, or sorry, in, in Hawaii, uh, in freshwater currently have. Um, and that one passed with some amendments, and the amendments that, that, that are going to go along with that are going to really be geared towards making sure that some incidental tourist, like let's imagine that Jared takes Caitlin to Hawaii on vacation and they go out snorkeling together and they come upon a couple of aquarium fishermen. Um, they don't want to be caught up in this harassment law uh, accidentally. Um, and then finally, HB 873, in my mind, is the one to really watch here. Um, that originally was a pretty straight up ban bill and that has been amended to um, to include some provisions that would uh, instead of banning the fishery uh, recommend to the Department of Land and Natural Resources and specifically the, the Division of Aquatic Resources to uh, regulate the fishery more stringently than it's currently regulated. So once a bill is deferred, is it subject to any further review, um, or is that the end of it? Dana's probably a much better uh, person to answer this question than I am. My understanding is that um, I, I expect that we will see HB 606 and HB 883, the two bills that were deferred last week, that we will see them die in committee, um, and they'll, they'll probably be, they will automatically be reintroduced next year, and we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. Dana? Does that sound about right? I, I believe that's the way it works, and I believe that's the way it will proceed. Uh, I, too, have the concerns about Bill 873. We don't know exactly what the amendments will be yet. Mm -hmm. um, my representative is Cindy Evans, and she was a co-sponsor for these bills, so I, uh, I won't get much help from her, unfortunately. Cindy Evans has been very engaged in the aquarium um, debate over the years. Um, most recently, a couple years ago, I think it was 2012, um, she was uh, really a, a force behind introducing some bills that the aquarium trade and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, and other uh, pro-aquarium trade groups got behind several of Cindy Evans' bills that would have uh, better regulated the fishery in terms of um, adding some adaptive management. Uh, uh, limited entry was a bill that was that was introduced by her. Um, so it was really kind of a surprise this year when when we saw some of these bills introduced, or, or specifically these, these ban bills and moratoriums um, by Cindy Evans. Dana probably has a much better read on that, but it, it, it was surprising. I, I will go to the uh, county council meeting Tuesday and uh, I guess some testimony. So we've got two bills being heard at the county council level on Tuesday. And um, from sort of my overall view of the situation and knowing the county council and interviewing county council members in the past and knowing the state legislator and legislature and interviewing state folks in the past, uh, I'm much more concerned about what could happen at the county council level. Um, so we've got these two bills. We've got Bill 318, and that is the one that was uh, discussed back in November and um, was deferred at that point until a later date, and Tuesday is the later date. And then we've got, uh, we've got uh, county council bill, is it 24? Is that right, Dana? Yeah, 24. 
Yeah, so 24 would basically put in place, um, it would make a, a, a county license necessary for aquarium fishers in the West Hawaii aquarium fishery. So in Hawaii, statewide, we have an aquarium fishery, but then we have many smaller aquarium, or not many, but a few smaller aquarium fisheries within Hawaii. Um, the West Hawaii Aquarium Fishery, uh, which which takes place primarily off the, the coast of the island, the island of Hawaii, um, is about 70% of the overall aquarium harvest. So it's the largest aquarium fishery by far. And this Bill 24 would have put in place a separate county license that would be necessary for an aquarium fisherman to acquire in addition to the state. And I think it could be up to $3,100 um, per fisherman in that fishery to have the right to fish. Wow, so it's pretty expensive. Yeah, so, Dana, you were talking about that while while you were gone, Rhett. Dana brought it up, and he was talking about um, the Declevis butterfly. Not the Declevis butterfly, but the... Um, the long nose. The long nose, uh, the long nose butterfly, right. and then... Um, I think you mentioned uh, any, butterflies and as a species in general. Yeah, any, any butterfly fish, uh, Morsch idol, Achilles tame, uh, all would require an additional $1,000 fee to collect those. Um, if there's a bright side to this, this is enforced by the county police, and I this is going to be a low priority with them, I can promise you. Uh, unfortunately, that's about the only thing I good I could say about this should it pass. Right. And enforcement obviously is, is going to be the key to uh, the whole law working if it passes. I think critics of this bill look at it as a as a backdoor way to shut down the fishery because it would essentially make the fishery cost prohibitive. And the thing that the thing that really resonates with me and I'm stepping out a little bit from the discussion of just the aquarium fishery. Um, but the thing that resonates with me is that it, it appears to me to be a really punitive um, measure insofar as it would not, this license would only be applied to aquarium fishers. Now, the aquarium fishery in West Hawaii is far and away the most valuable inshore fishery in terms of dollars, um, you know, in West Hawaii. Um, and, and statewide. Um, but it, it, the catch is actually um, not significantly more in terms of biomass than the commercial catch or the recreational catch in West Hawaii. And so to impose this additional fee and these additional procedures on aquarium fishermen, but not to impose them on other fishermen, really appears to be nothing short of punitive. If you want to enact something like this, do it fishery-wide. Do it to all the fisheries. Um, and, and that's obviously not what's happening. This is targeted just towards the aquarium fishery. Right. Yeah, it makes it pretty clear that you've got, you know, the industry with a target on their back or something like that. I mean, it's... Like you said, Rhett, you definitely, if you're going to do something like that, the logic behind something that you, you'd be wanting to protect the fish as a species wide, not just targeting it at a very niche part of it. I mean, not niche, but I mean, you're talking about a very small targeted area as opposed to, like you said, recreational fishing, sport fishing, commercial fishing. And yeah, so like you said, it's a bit, that is, that is definitely putting a target right on the, you know, the aquarium fishers back. And that's, that's just, is not fair. Oh, so I'd like to address the difference between the love legislative process of the House bills, uh, Senate bills versus what the process is for uh, the Endangered Species Act. That, that's a really nice mystery rasp behind you. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder who painted that. It's a mystery. <laughs> Beautiful. It is a mystery. <laughs> So, so I think, uh, Caitlin, I think your question is, is really important. Um, I think a lot of, at least in my reporting and in, and, you know, I just went down to Dallas and, and gave a talk, um, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and then I was, and then you were stuck. <laughs> I was stuck. Yes. Small airplanes, lots of snow. Um, but, uh, but what strikes me when I talk to, 
Clarist to individual hobbyists is that they oftentimes group all of this stuff together, um, ESA and legislation. And they're really very different things. Um, so legislation is, uh, is, is, a, is a whole legislative process, and it's um, pretty transparent, um, and it, it's political. It's extremely political. The ESA is about rulemaking. So this is about um, a government organization, in the case of marine aquarium animals, um, the 20 species of coral, which are recently listed under the ESA, um, the uh, clownfish, which is uh, under status review right now, and the Bengay cardinal fish, which had a proposed rule released recently. Um, all of those, that's under the National Marine Fisheries Service, and that's an administrative rulemaking process. So there's lots of opportunity for public input, and there is some politicking possibly that you can talk about, but really it's a very data-driven process, mm -hmm. whereas the legislative process is in nearly as data-driven. Anybody can, you know, can get the support behind a bill and get a bill written, get a bill drafted, get it introduced, and see what happens. Um, with the ESA, you really need to be able to demonstrate that you have data. Now, we could debate the data, but you need to demonstrate you have the data in order to get an ESA petition started. So really different legislation, administrative rulemaking. Yeah, just to kind of comment on how Rhett started off with it being um, – the oftentimes confused. I mean, for me as uh, you know, a hobbyist and, and a president of a club, I, I interact with a lot of hobbyists on a regular basis. And by far and away, I've seen these two being kind of lumped together very, very frequently and having to explain constantly, no, this is, these are two different things that are happening here and they have a different process and it's, you can't lump these two together. You have to look at them differently. And, you know, Right, just said. I mean, you've got a data-driven process with the ESA, and with the stuff going on here in Hawaii, it's it's, it's more politics. And right. Getting people to understand that is, you know, it's it's sometimes it's difficult. I mean, you see uh, information being posted on the message boards, on Facebook, and it's coming from people in the industry who are well respected, and sometimes. And even they're getting it confused, and that's right. part of the problem. You're getting this information that's disseminated out there from people that are supposed to be in the know, and they're lumping it together, and it's causing confusion. So it's really important to differentiate the two. Absolutely. I mean, Rhett and I have had this discussion several times about, you know, how how it, you know making sure that we're factual. And I know Rhett, Rhett's always pounding on the desk, facts, 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 and um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, we had a, t <laughs> <laughs> I'd go get my cat, but I don't know if he, he caught up with this. Yeah. She keeps running into my leg, so I thought I'd bring her up. I feel like every video I do, there's always like a photo bombing pet, <laughs> video bombing pet. <laughs> uh, but Rich has the best photo bombing pets. I know. So something that. I think we talked about um, last time or a couple times ago, Caitlin, when we were talking with Rich, I think we talked about perceptions mm -hmm. and how perceptions can be um, really challenging for the aquarium trade. The aquarium trade, I think, needs to really have a long, hard look in the mirror and understand where, where the trade is today, or as Rich would say, trade industry hobby. Um, we need to understand where we are today and where we're headed. And in Hawaii, the anti-aquarium trade activists or the anti-aquarium fishery activists have really done a very good job of, um, of painting a very negative perception of the aquarium fishery. And that's a huge concern because if any of these bills pass, they will pass at least from my perspective, they will pass without data supporting them. The, the data do not show that the fishery is unsustainable. The data show that the fishery is very sustainable. The, the data show that management is in fact working. Right. And if these anti-trade activists are able to alter or influence public perception enough to get the aquarium fishery in Hawaii shut down, I think 
that's just going to be the beginning of the end for the aquarium trade. Because Hawaii is far and away, with the possible exception of Australia, the most defensible aquarium fishery on the face of the earth. Right. So the fact that the ESA is more data driven versus, you know, lawmakers with agendas that make bills, this that makes bills like the ones proposed in Hawaii uh, more detrimental, would you say? It, it worries me a lot. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that if if one of these bills passes in Hawaii, one of the anti-fishery, one of the bills that would shut down the aquarium fishery, if that were to pass, I think that would have significant effects globally for the aquarium trade. Well, how is the process different in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, rather? Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, um, obviously not during this interview, but let's say in Indonesia or um, in Australia or Fiji or any of these other places, uh, how would something like what happens in Hawaii impact what's going on in like what's the Coral Triangle, for example, you know, in the Indonesia area? Would you I don't think it would necessarily have a direct effect on how the fishery is managed in some of these other countries. What I think it would do is I think, and I can tell you this from firsthand experience, you know, I, so I report on, I report on all fisheries, not just aquarium fisheries. I do a lot of work with food fisheries, seafood, and the people who are watching fisheries issues in Washington on the federal level are watching Hawaii very closely. And I think if things go in a direction in Hawaii that, you know, it's determined by the legislature, by the, you know, it's determined that these fisheries need to be closed, I think you know, I think that I think that the feds are going to clamp down on imports in the, in the exact same way that we have concerns about food fisheries right now. You know, it's just you know, this is the this is the the uh, the seafood industry um, conference. What is that? <laughs> My wife just got done eating dinner and she's putting stuff in the sink and something fell. So. Well, at least but, she's yeah. putting it in the sink. She's being clean. So, <laughs> so I, I just worry that, that, um, that, you know, if we lose, if the aquarium trade loses Hawaii, I think it'll be very easy for the anti-aquarium activist to exert enough pressure to, to shut down imports of other fishes about fisheries that we are far more concerned about. Now, we've talked about this at length in the past, Caitlin, um, but, you know, this trade is predominantly influenced or, or dependent upon wild-caught fishes from Indonesia and the Philippines. And these are the two countries about which we have the most concerns regarding sustainability, legality, uh, human rights abuses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're able to, or if the anti-trade Aquarius, if the anti-trade uh, activists are able to shut down Hawaii, it's not a very difficult argument to say we have no business importing fishes from these other countries. So you're talking about bypassing the ESA process and closing fishery or importing a, a fish from the Philippines or Indonesia? Well, I mean, all it would take is California to take this up. In the le and and that, this is what I worry about. I worry about um, uh, legislative effort succeeding in Hawaii based on no data. I would have no concern if the legislative effort to close down the fishery succeeded based on data of an unsustainable fishery. But that's just, that's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a, a fishery that by every peer-reviewed scientific paper um, is, is a sustainable fishery. If we lose that fishery, what's to stop California or what's to stop anti-trade activists from then turning their attention to California? And, sh and saying that it will be illegal to import fishes from countries that we cannot verify X, Y, and Z, whatever X, Y, and Z may be. But look at these bills that we're looking at now in Hawaii. You know, So what if they said, we, we won't accept the illegal to import fishes to California that are shipped in less than one gallon of water. It'll be illegal to import fishes to California that have been vented or fizzed or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, if these same, if the same, the exact same legislative efforts that are occurring in Hawaii right now, 
Krakoa applied to California, that would have a devastating effect on the aquarium trade because so many of the importers are the uh, the county uh, bill number twenty four. They have a they've set a mortality rate of only one percent. Uh, that's after the fish is caught and uh, uh, until it's shipped. So I I think that's going to be a tough one for them to meet. Um, yeah, I would agree. I, I know, Fortunately, yeah. something I know, like quality marine, for an example, in, in my dealing with with Chris is, uh, I believe they have like a two percent mortality rate that they use as like a, a cutoff point, and you know that's considered to be a, a pretty low number. So if you drop something to one percent, I mean, wow, you're cutting that in half, which is already considered to be, uh, you know, they have some of the more exceptional practices that. You know, making sure that you know the, the fisheries that they're collecting from are sustainable. So, I know the collectors here are not taking this lying down. Uh, I won't mention any names, but I've talked to uh, two collectors who are, are definitely, uh, uh, obviously, very interested in seeing these bills fail. Um, combined with the information that Bill Walsh will present that obviously shows the fishery is well managed. Uh, on a personal note, um, on a calm morning, I can walk out on my lanai and see the yellow tangs uh, feeding on, on some of the algae turfs. And uh, there, there are some mornings that the, the water is literally yellow in spots. Um, so um, just from, from a strict, strictly visual standpoint, um, the fishery is doing quite well here. I, I don't think I've ever seen as many yellow tanks uh, in the little cove out front here as, uh, as any time I've been here in the last 16 years. Positive note, little sunshine to a not so fun discussion. I mean, we had a we had a phenomenal year in Hawaii. Uh, I mean, this is this is probably a generation event that happened this year in terms of recruitment. It is uh, the the spawning event was just through the roof, and we're going to see a huge bump from that. Um, and that's been used by both sides as justification for either further curtailing the fishery or you know, allowing the fishery to continue um, sort of unchanged. But um, but it is it is remarkable. These uh, you know, I think that. At the county council level, um, I think that people aren't always aware of the biology of these fishes. Not that they should be, um, but pelagic reef fishes is, is a really complex and, and little understood uh, thing at this point. And, um, and what happened in Hawaii this year is, is, is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, and how that will play out a year from now, two years from now. We're not sure, but, you know, if you look back to that report that the Department of Land and Natural Resources put out in December, authored by uh, Dr. Walsh, um, you know, there are literally millions more reef fishes, millions more, on the reefs of West Hawaii today than there were back in 1998 when the legislature passed Act 306, which was, I mean... Let's not forget, so I'm going to talk about this tonight, but the, the, the debate here, the controversy in Hawaii predates, uh, you know, it goes way, way, way back. I mean, this was already a full-fledged, nasty, ugly debate in the 90s. And the legislature got involved in the 90s. They passed Act 306 in the 90s, which would put more management in place in West Hawaii. And those management measures are working. By every measure, by every scientist, by every peer-reviewed paper, those management management me measures are working, and that's because they have uh, really an incredibly innovative. Are, are you on the Fisheries Council, Dana? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought you were. Yeah. So you, you've got this West Hawaii Fisheries Council, which is a result. It's a multi-stakeholder group. And, and Danny, you can talk about it in a little more detail. But it's this multi-stakeholder group that's really an innovative approach to fisheries management um, that was put in place as, as a result of Act 306. You've got these 
fishery man or fishery replenishment areas, the FRAs, in addition to the NPAs that put over 30% of the coast of West Hawaii off limits to aquarium fishing. And the result of all of this, not to mention the most significant thing that the West Hawaii Fisheries Council accomplished was to put in place the rules package last year, which put this 40 species whitelist in place and added uh, bag limits and um, and size limits to to the to the, the, the three most uh, commonly collected fishes. Um, all of this, all of these management measures, have resulted in a fishery that is doing really well. We have a lot of improvement. This is a story that we need to, as a positive story, not just in the aquarium world, but fisheries wide. This is a model we need to export to other places. This is not a model that we need to shut down and say that it's not working. Exactly. Uh, the, the model they have here is studied around the world um, to, to uh, guide other efforts like this to, to protect the reefs. Um, one thing I'll say about the Fishery Council, uh, we just had a strategy meeting for 2015, and uh, the number one item is aquarium fish collection issues. And um, the majority of the council believes that if these laws are passed to outlaw aquarium fishing, that the efforts of the council will have been a failure um, it, it's odd to see uh, some people who I know personally on the council, uh, they really changed their attitude um, about fish collection. At one time, they were adamantly against any sort of uh, aquarium fish collection. Uh, but the, the compromise that was made with the uh, green protected areas and, and the spillover that results in, into the uh, collection areas. It's worked so well that that has changed the mindset uh, of some of the poor, the people that were really hardcore against the, the collection. So it, it uh, Red's right. This, this has been a very successful model. Uh, there is one thing the council wants to work on this year, and that's limited entry for the uh, aquarium fish collection collections. Uh, so there, there will be uh, a few more restrictions, I think, but uh, just my gut feeling from uh, what I heard at the strategy meeting is that uh, if, if the uh, Fishery Council could testify as a body, they would uh, try to defeat these laws. So it's interesting that with such a positive result as you know, with this model that, that this year all these bills come out? Well, it's, it's not, it's actually not an unusually high number of bills. These, these bills get introduced every year right. and we've got this two year session. So the, this will persist into next year. We will have at least eight bills next year, unless some of these pass, um, new ones may be introduced. Um, so we see this every year. Um, and, and I think, we need to look to the folks in Hawaii that have consistently taken the time to go to the county council meetings, to go to the state legislature, to testify um, against these bills and to put the data forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as frustrating as I'm sure it must be for Dana and, you know, friends of mine who or you know, people that I've, I've gotten to know over the course of reporting on these stories over the years, um, as frustrating as it is to have these bills constantly come up, the one really positive thing here is that consistently the state legislature has not passed any of these bills. Mm -hmm. And they have consistently, you know, the data has consistently won. But it takes a lot of effort to make that happen. Right. Now, can I touch on something that, that Dana said regarding limited entry. Yeah, go ahead. So, so limited entry is a concept in fisheries where you basically regulate, then you limit the number of people who can actually get a permit to fish in the fishery. Um, it's a it's a somewhat controversial concept in fisheries. Um, it's not at all an uncommon concept in fisheries to have a limited entry fishery. Um, this notion of limited entry is one of the amendments that was that has been talked about and we have not seen or I have personally not seen 
the, the new language for uh, HB 873 um, that's in the House and the, the state legislature. But one of the things that's supposedly in there is a recommendation to DLNR to adopt a limited entry fishery. So um, even, even if this doesn't happen at the West Hawaii Fisheries Council level, so when the West Hawaii Fisheries Council works on something, they can move something up through the county through the council process to DLNR, and then it can become law through administrative rulemaking. So there's a whole process to make a rule that doesn't deal with the legislative process. So what, what, what Dana's talking about is maybe creating a limited entry uh, fishery through administrative rulemaking. At the same time, we now have this bill, 873, that looks like it's going to move forward in the state legislature this year, which is also going to recommend to DLNR to have a limited entry fishery. So this notion of a limited entry fishery is really um, gaining momentum. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, I, I think we'll probably at some point in the future see a limited entry fishery in Hawaii. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. No. Uh, limited nope. entry. Again, it's all a matter of compromise. So while we're on the note of good and bad, I actually wanted to just uh, touch a little bit on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, is that, you know, a friend or foe? You hear so, so many mixed kind of uh, opinions on that, people saying, you know, our, our hobbies under attack, industries under attack from, from the ESA, but are they really a negative element here you know it touches on kind of what we talked about a little while ago where we needed to differentiate between the two and as Rhett's mentioned several times throughout this whole interview is that the ESA is more data driven and we may not always agree with what the end result is going to be but there's you know going to be justification for it now obviously the ESA has implications on our hobby but the data that's being presented to you know the National Marine Fisheries Service shows that there is need for it. So it, it, it kind of depends on your perspective too. So you know if you're an, you know like I guess I for I, I guess I would be a good example. You know I work in the industry although you know I have a marine fisheries background and I kind of see beyond it. But you know there are people that I work with and people that you know I I know in the industry who look at it as a foe because of the potential and impact of it. But I think it's a matter of perspective uh, for the ESA, whether it's friend or foe. You know, personally, you know, Rhett and, you know, and Caitlin, we both talked about this before in the past, is if there's data there and it shows that something needs to be done, then that's fine. I, I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. You know, there needs to be a point where we as a hobby as hobbyists or you know industry professionals say you know who are we to interrupt with this process when there is data that shows that you know maybe there needs to be better management or there needs to be uh, some sort of you know uh, regulations on the on what comes in or imported and things like that and you know it's something that Rhett and I have talked about quite a bit it's you know this friend or foe type thing. And, you know, I'm sure Rhett can go on uh, in, in his experiences with who he's interacted with. Well, I, I think the issues I have are when some acropora, and I, I think euphilia species are listed on the endangered species. Uh, how many millions of colonies are out there? Are they truly endangered? Um, another point, if, uh, some of the wildlife people inspecting some of the shipments coming in. If, if you know anything about coral ID, you've got to sacrifice yeah. the animal and take a look at the coral light and all that sort of thing. Uh, uh, a lot of people claim to be able to ID some of the aquifer species just on site. And uh, I, I think that's a lot more difficult than most people make it out to be. Um, and that would apply to the inspectors as well. If we see a, if they inspect a shipment coming in that has aquifer specimens in it, um, 
what's to stop them from rejecting the, the whole shipment just based on an incorrect ID? Yeah, and, and that is one issue that that I do have with it is the enforcement of it. You know, we as hobbyists who see a lot of these corals a lot of the time, we have a very difficult time identifying them. Now, that would probably be more of a result of the worst case scenario where they say, okay, these species are, are cannot be imported. Um, and we don't know if that's going to happen yet. Uh, it's we're still in that 4D ruling period, uh, rule or the 4D commenting period, I should say, is to what is going to be the end result of these species being listed under the ESA. Yeah, even if it's data driven, I'm not really sure that the data supports uh, prohibition of uh, importation of some of these species, and that's open to discussion and debate. But that's mm -hmm. that's my Absolutely. personal opinion. Um, I know Bruce Carlson told me a long time ago that, <clears throat> you know, the corals really aren't endangered at this point. Their reproduction rates are still very, very high. And uh, uh, But there again, open to debate. Yeah, and the other part of it is the reason why they're listing it is not necessarily, you know, it's not targeting our hobby. That was something we talked about before is that, They've specifically put in there that it's you know global warming, pollution, um, ocean acidification, things like that. So it makes it tricky. I mean, those are obviously issues that we're having in our world, and you know it's something that in the future is going to only get worse. So I, I can see where you know based upon the reason why they're petitioning these corals that. There is obviously evidence there that we are going through these things like ocean acidification and global warming. But I, I think we have to look at that in a historical perspective. Uh, how many mass extinctions have there been over the millennia? Uh, corals have disappeared from the fossil record. I'm sorry. Is that right, Dana? Six? It, six. I was thinking I, I, seven, I think it was... but it might it may be six. Yeah. Right. Uh, we'll double check on that. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, yeah. There, there have been a question. number of mass extensions. Let's excited. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, Ganiapora lived in the Caribbean at one time and they disappeared uh, after the uh, Northern Hemisphere Ice Age. So, uh, I mean, these, as the saying at a Jurassic Park went, uh, life will find a way. Um, corals have survived, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, real challenges before. Um, I'm not too sure I buy into the gloom and doom that we hear, I, and I'm trying to be optimistic about this. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the corals have, have seen challenges, and they've managed to find a way to survive. That's not a very popular stance to take, but uh, it's the opinion I have. But it, it's true. I mean, you know, I, I, I have a draft manuscript out for a book called Coral, and, um, and one of the things I look at in the very first chapter of that book is, um, you know, coral is arguably the only organism or one of the very few organisms that has, a, that has survived every mass extinction event on the face of the earth in one way, shape, or form. Coral reefs may go by the wayside. The, the reef building structure, reefs might change dramatically. It might not be recognizable uh, as coral, but coral has survived. Coral's found a way to survive. And that's a great thing. I think that's an important thing to, rem to remind people. I think that's something that Aquarists certainly know from personal stories in their own tanks. You know, that, that little frag that they drop behind and they hadn't seen for years, and then all of a sudden, boom, there was this new coral growing. Um, we hear these stories all the time, and, that, and that's fantastic. When it comes to the ESA and coral listings, I think something that's really important to keep in mind is that the petitioning organization, the petitioning agency that, that put all of these corals up for ESA listing, that petition, National Marine Fishery Service, they just imported a list of corals that in, uh, you know, that, that the world-renowned coral reef scientist 
believed were in trouble at a particular snapshot in time. So they didn't like pick and they didn't just go out there and sort of open up book corals or pick corals that they thought were in danger. Instead, they went back to this one paper that was published in Science and recommended that these corals were the corals that were at risk. Now, are those the most at-risk corals? I think that's the debate we're having. There are certainly corals that I think the data that we have today shows may be more at risk than some of these species that have currently been listed, some of the 20 species that have been listed. Yeah, and that, um, that list originally started out as a much larger list, and it was refined down to a, a much smaller list. So, right. you know, like, like Dana said, maybe not all of them necessarily are in that position where they need to be protected, but certainly there was some due diligence done to determine, okay, well, maybe we don't need, was it, I think it was, what, 66 they started out with or something 80, like that? 80. 80, and then they, they narrowed it down, and then they narrowed it down again. So... I, I so done the petition agency originally petitioned 83 corals to be listed under the ESA. And after National Marine Fisheries Service took a look at that, they said, okay, 82 of these warrant a deeper look. And they took a look at those and they came back at the end of their status review and they said it was 66, I think, of these species were proposed to be listed, some endangered, some threatened. And then we entered into the next phase of public comment. Um, a lot of new information came to light during that during that phase, and uh, ultimately the list was reduced from 66, some endangered, some threatened, to just 20, all threatened, none endangered. And so, you know, that so that's so that sort of was a system. I think that was an example, a snapshot of, of the system kind of working. And now we have these 20 species that have been listed, and now there's discussion looking at that data for those 20 species. And I think that's a really uh, a healthy, positive thing. You know, National Marine Fisheries Service published their final rule, and now people are taking a much closer look at those 20 species. Um, you know, I, I think that, so if I put myself in the, in the shoes of a marine aquarist, looking at my aquarium and thinking that I may no longer be able to uh, import or I may no longer be able to keep certain species of euphelia or aquaphora as a result of an ESA listing, I would be really angry and upset. But overall, in the much larger picture, I think the fact that we're having a discussion on a national level about coral and the risks that coral face is a really positive thing. So we need to mitigate those two things. And I think National Marine Fisheries Service is doing a pretty good job of bending over backwards to really be able to work with stakeholder groups to make sure that they're not unnecessarily taking away, um, you know, taking away activities related to coral that maybe the marine aquarium probably enjoys. But by the same token, they're elevating the concern about coral internationally, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, part of the data that they accepted came from the aquarium trade, from from PJAC, and that's that's a good thing that they're open to you know review of that kind of thing. They're not just looking at it from the standpoint of the petitioner, and they're being open to like you said, it's a multi stakeholder process, and they're allowing that. So, I think it's a very positive thing in terms of the way the process is un is unfoiling, unfoiling. But uh, you know. The, the thing that still just bothers me is that, you know, this, the, the confusion that you're seeing. And, and like you said, it, you know, you looked at your tank and you saw the, uh, the Acropora or you saw the Euphelia in your tank and you're thinking about, oh, I'm no longer going to be able to keep these. Absolutely, they're going to be angry. And then they they, they just kind of confuse the process. And that's, that's what I see. You know, I, I've been working in the industry for a long time. I used to work in an aquarium store. And so I got to interact with a lot of people and this was a, a topic that would come up all the time. And there was a lot of confusion with it. So, you know, Dana has great points about, you know, coral being very resilient. And Rhett makes great points about the process. And, you know, I think it's, I think the process is, is working. That, that This process is working the way that they're doing it right now. And I, I think it's, it's much better than what we're seeing in Hawaii. That's, you know, kind of what we were doing earlier, describing or comparing the two. So, right. Yeah. You know. 
Yeah, and I think that's critical to bring this back to Hawaii and to understand that, you know, what we're dealing with in the ESA level, every step along the way, we have to return to the data when we're considering an ESA listing. And we can have a lot of debate about that data. Um, but when we're dealing with the legislative process in Hawaii, it does not have to come back to the data. The legislation does not, you know, it doesn't have to return to the data. Look at, so look at HB 873. HB 873 leads with a sentence that says that the aquarium trade is extracting coral at an unsustainable rate from Hawaii's reefs. No coral is extracted from Hawaii's reefs for the aquarium trade. It just doesn't happen. Nope. Like, so we, you know, to look at that bill and to see just this colossal inaccuracy in the very first sentence of a six paragraph preamble to why the aquarium fishery needs to be shut down, I think really suggests to us that, you know, it's, it's very political. It's very emotional. Yep. Um, and it's not very data driven. Brett, I mean, you've, you spent more time than probably any of us, obviously, interacting with some of these people in Hawaii who are the ones trying to support these kinds of things. And uh, I mean, I've been reading about it, you know, your experiences with, dare I say his name, Robert Wittner and this emotional process. And you, it's been, he's been very upfront in saying that this isn't a matter of data. He wouldn't support it one way or the other it's it's more of a um, an ethical thing is is what this is being driven off of yeah the the anti-trade activists in hawaii are not they're not willing to acknowledge that this is a fishery and so fisheries management means nothing to them yeah um i think if you go back to my 2009 or 2010 uh, feature article in Coral, which really looked at sort of the history of the aquarium issue in Hawaii. Um, I interviewed Robert Wintner in person um, for that article. And one of the things he said in the interview, and I think I put into that article in a quotation, was, you know, I, I think he said, I won't use the F word. I won't use the fishery word. Um, it's not a fishery to him. It's about emotion. It's about interacting with species. And I mean, this is what this is this is this is reef fishing. So these are gregarious for the reason that aquarists keep them in their tank because they you know they, these are animals that that people develop relationships with. Um, it's very different than a pelagic uh, you know tuna or mahi mahi or dorado, um, you know that's going to you know shoot by you in the ocean and take off. You know if you even get a chance to see it. When you're diving or snorkeling on a reef, you spend time face to face with these beautiful, quirky, gregarious, interesting, personable animals, and and that and I think that just that that take that that takes the whole conversation into the realm of emotion as opposed to you know fishery and and that's and that's a valid and. It, you know, I've said this to, to Robert Winter in the past and to Renee Amberger. That's a valid discussion. And to the folks of the Humane Society, we should be having a discussion as a society about whether it's right to keep animals in captivity. That's fine. That's a, that's a great discussion to have. And, and I fully support that. But let's, let's talk about it for what it is, as opposed to trying to put that argument into the guise of sustainability. Because that's ultimately what is done when they take these bills to the legislature. Yeah, it's, it's all they these can really bills do. legislature under the guise of it's unsustainable, and it's not really about sustainability. It's about emotion, and it's about ethics. It's about morality, and those are very different things. And it's very difficult to legislate ethics and morality. It's much easier to legislate a fishery and talk about sustainable yield and talk about how many fish you can extract from a specific area and keep the area, the ecosystem and the population healthy. To demonstrate what an emotional issue this is, I've seen pictures of the uh, 
public meetings that were held when the brain protected areas were proposed. Uh, the most attended public hearing ever in Kona or on this island uh, was for the marine protected area um, preview, and they had 900 people show up. Wow. And uh, yep. I mean, that's, uh, that's when, when you consider the size of Kona, you know, 20,000 people for that many people to show up. That's a pretty one in 20, situation, yeah. Uh, yeah. One in 20 to show up to, uh, and I, I know a lot of these people, and unfortunately, they, they are very emotional about the issue. I think that's a danger that we face with the uh, county legislation. I, I read in the paper that 85 people showed up to testify uh, about the county bills and 55 wanted to ban, I, I'm getting some signals from Red, but uh, <laughs> he's coaching Eight, me. 85, 85 or 4? Yeah, yeah, it was... Uh, uh, it was two to one, uh, basically, that they want to shut down the fishery. So that's what we're facing. Uh, these groups are, are getting more and more organized. Uh, they're advertising. If you go to West Hawaii today, and maybe you've seen it, if you go to the newspaper online, uh, Renee Umberger's, uh, she, she's advertising to sign the petition. Uh, uh, supporting the ban on uh, fish collection, so they're they're well organized, and it may go like the super ferry. Uh, they tried and tried and tried to shut the super ferry down, and eventually, uh, through persistence, they uh, succeeded. Yeah, something you kind of talked about with the uh, the MPAs. We we had that happen here in California. Um, I think it's been four or five, six years, something like that. And we don't have, you know, we don't really have a ornamental, you know, trade, you know, source here. But it, it was targeting, you know, the recreational and commercial fisheries. And it, and it kind of worked its way down from Northern California down to Southern California. And when it came down to Southern California, we have a very uh, big recreational uh, fishery here. And it became a very, very emotional uh, topic when they had these open discussion meetings to the public. And the, the one thing that I've noticed throughout all of this is that, you know, the aquarium industry, it, it's not very organized. We don't have a, a supporting body. I mean, we have PJAC, but PJAC is really, you know, they, they've got a lot of different fronts that they have to, to worry about, whereas we're just one small part of it. And the one thing that we have we had here in Southern California was uh, SAC, it's the uh, Southern California Marine uh, Aquarium. I can't remember the, the, what it means anymore. It's been a while now, but the, their sole purpose was to re represent the recreational and, you know, the commercial fishery here through, you know, the government process. And, you know, that's the part that scares me the most is that we are not very organized. The people who are opposing our industry are very organized and they're, they're very you know, emotionally charged and, and they're willing to stick through this. And, you know, being in the industry as long as I have, it, it, I, I would love to see some, some body come out of this where they're solely representing our industry. Right. You know, as opposed to relying on, you know, relying solely on PJAC, who, like I said, you know, they've done a lot of great things, but their sole purpose is not to defend the aquarium industry. And I think that's something that we need to see happen. Now, who, who is that going to be that steps up and does it? I don't know. You know, I, we, you know, when we had the MLPA process go here, go down here in Southern California, you know, we didn't get the exact result that was wanted for, the, the you know the recreational in Southern California more recreational fishery with you know we have they call it commercial but it's it's the recreational fishery with the sport fishing fleet that we have here in Southern California and they were pretty well represented so they were able to kind of fend off I guess is the best way to put it what some of these environmentalists wanted to do which was really shut down the entire fishery I mean the proposed maps they had of closed areas 
in the very beginning is nowhere near what it is now. They've closed some areas, but um, it didn't take a huge chunk out of the recreational fishery here. So it, it, it's kind of a good example of what you know, having an organization that solely represents your industry can do in the long run. Right. Um, it's funny with uh, all of these conversations that we keep having, uh, two recurring things that I keep seeing come up and we keep looping around to our data and uh, this hypothetical organized body. And I think that could be an interesting topic for later discussion, like what would an organized body look like? What would that entail? And what would be ideal for us to move forward where we can fight this and, you know, tie in ethics and sustainability and be responsible in this whole thing. So I'm curious to see what happens with everything in Hawaii, where this, where this is going to go. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately, I mean, I think, I think the aquarium trade needs a third party certification scheme um, to, to, to be truly defensible moving forward. And Hawaii is a great place to start with that. You know, Hawaii has the data. Hawaii has the, you know, they have already got the monitoring in place. Um, Hawaii can demonstrate that it is a sustainable fishery. And so, uh, it, it, you know, the aquarium trade should do what it takes to defend the Hawaii aquarium fishery, should build on those strengths, should build on what people like Dana and the West Hawaii Fisheries Council are doing, which is innovative, groundbreaking, and needs to be championed and talked about and exported to other fisheries um, rather than, you know, really just sort of shutting it down, um, you know, where it is. And that's, that, that's how we need to move forward. And I, I don't see how we do that without some sort of third-party certification scheme. It's great to talk about the industry, taking care of the industry, and the industry, you know, stepping up and monitoring itself. But ultimately, to be truly credible, we're going to have to have some sort of third-party assurance that the trade is, in fact, sustainable. And Hawaii is a great place to start for that. No, I agree. I think that would be good. And, I mean, we've seen attempts at it in the past, but, you know, unfortunately, they've kind of fallen through. But it, it certainly would be a, a good thing to have where you've got someone kind of, uh, you know, I guess overlooking what's going on and making sure that everything is done on, you know, a sustainable manner and you know, keeping things on the up and up, I guess, is the best way to put it. So. Yeah, it's certainly food for thought, and that's something that I'll bring up at the next fishery council meeting. Um, make the suggestion and, and see what happens. Uh, right now we have representatives of the uh, Nature Conservancy, um, is one of the moderators there, and interestingly enough that they are they are opposed to these proposed laws. Uh, they they think that the uh, self monitoring uh, and um, and the self regulation uh, seems to be working pretty well, and if they can keep the politicians out of it and have some sort of basis for a protocol in place and not let the politicians get involved, we'll, we'll be better off. Yeah, these decisions need to, I mean, overall, overarching concept here, these decisions need to not be made at the legislative level. Legislators have no business, legisl you know, determining fisheries management. They don't have the data. They don't have the people in the water. They don't know what's going on. It, it's too political. We need to have these decisions made by administrative rulemaking, advised by a community multi-stakeholder group like the West Hawaii Fisheries Council, um, and that that's the way to do it. And so, and this isn't just a Hawaii thing. Let's look at Hawaii. I mean, let's look at Florida. Florida, when we dealt with the lionfish ban last year, what a nightmare when the legislature started getting involved with how they were going to regulate lionfish in the state of Hawaii. It needed to happen through administrative rulemaking. Now, unfortunately, the body in Florida that's responsible for making those rules didn't rely on the data. But, you know, we want it to happen through administrative rulemaking, not through legislation. I wish Sarah Peck was still here. She had quite a following, and she could persuade many people. Um, there's 
couple of people trying to step into her place, and uh, they're not on the council. I'll contact them and and see what we can do. Maybe we'll drum up a little support from the outside. Well, definitely keep us updated on what happens um, uh, on yeah. your end. Be nice to hear good news uh, for a change. With everything that's going on. <laughs> and it should be all good news. This is a fantastic story. This is a story we should be celebrating. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Every year we get dragged back into this legislative process that right. you know takes away from the positive story that we should be telling. So we'll put a definitely keep an eye on everything that's going on. I hope we can update people with good news, more good news, more good news, and keep it a good story. Um, final last words. <laughs> We, we do need people to be engaged. If people feel strongly about these issues, if people care about their aquarium and they care about data-based fisheries management, they need to engage in testimony. Um, the amount of testimony that showed up on the, the committee member's desk last week for this hearing on the five House bills of the state legislature was unbelievable. We had well over a thousand pieces of testimony on one particular bill. And that's, that's incredibly important. So, you know, I, last word for me is, you know, if you, if you love your tank and you want to spend a few minutes educating yourself, engage in the process, submit testimony. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that's the one thing I've been trying to do. And I, and I've had people come to me, you know, through our club and is, you know, how do they submit testimony and, you know, you know they're all they're all looking for kind of more of a an easier way to go about it but you know i just tell them you know take some time i almost always point them in Rhett's direction and say you can easily go through a lot of this information there's a lot there it's good information and it's something that you can read through and and you can go submit testimony to and you know that's it. it's it's worked out it's worked out pretty well i mean we've seen a lot of enga- i've seen a lot of engagement from the hobby here, which I uh, was a little surprised, you know, because it's it hasn't always been that way. Um, you know, I, I've been paying attention to a lot of this legislative stuff that's been going on for years, and it used to be in the past where you'd bring it up and you'd immediately be looked at as the guy who's just trying to be the buzzkill, and you know, you'd immediately drag through the mud by some of these guys in the local forums. But it, I'm starting to see more and more people paying attention to it and wanting to kind of get involved, which is, it's very positive, uh, very, very positive. And, and one other thing, um, Dana, the light coming in on your head right now is amazing. Yeah. I mean, the albedo here. Yeah. It's like <laughs> this warm yellow color. Just Oh yeah. It's, it's uh, the, the sun is just about setting here. Uh, so you got to be reflect a little head. warmth your way. How about that? Um, one final word for me. Let me do a little homework here and see what I can uh, find out about submitting testimony on the county hearings that are to be held Tuesday. Um, also, I, I will bring that up at the Fishery Council about uh, seeing what we can do um, as far as uh, getting some sort of uh, proposals in place uh, about self-regulation. I'm a little distracted. I'm down to 7% on my battery, and I've got a flashing light here. Uh-oh. <laughs> so if you lose me, I'm not mad at you in the least. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks for the heads up. Um... Literally. <laughs> No, I, I I'm really interested to hear like to hear what what comes out of Tuesday from from you, Dana. I'm really really interested. So yeah, it's, uh, the the meeting's at one thirty. Uh, hopefully, Bruce Carlson's going to show up again to represent ACA, um, and I'm sure the collectors will be there too. So, so uh, one thing I can tell you is that him showing up, a lot of people that I've talked to already were really really happy that he did. So. You know, yeah, he's a good spokesperson. No doubt. Yeah, and so if, if that helps encourage him to speak up again, you know, there are people that are, really appreciate what he did already. So, yeah, he's done a great job for us. It really has. Great. Um, I guess my last words kind of will be: I promise to keep all of the readers, viewers, 
updated on whatever you guys share with me. Um, and I'm really excited that we actually finally got together, weather permitting, you know, health permitting, <laughs> all of it. It's been storm chasing permitting. <laughs> yeah, power out <laughs> power outages. So uh, thank you all for making it. It's it's a funny thing when you have people all over the world trying to get together at once. So I'm glad that we could work something out. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the invitation. You're yeah, always you. welcome. <laughs> It's great talking to you guys. I'm going to sign off. I'm down to two percent. Just me. Adios. Good talking to you guys. Bye, Take care. Good night, guys.